uh, learn from each other. And I really value all the comments that have been coming into the chat box and the questions that people have been asking. So like Raju said, we've now completed two th thematic groups. One was um, the introduction and overview to palliative care. And last week we saw the completion of humanitarian uh, aid settings and crisis settings and what role palliative care can play in that. Um, from this week on, we go into another thematic um, um, group of modules, which focuses more on mental health and, uh, and individuals within the system. And so as everybody knows, today's theme is the invisible patient. So uh, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm just going to ask people to observe this for a few minutes and just tell me, you can put it in the chat box and I can see the chat box, so not to worry. Um, what, what, what do you notice about this picture? Anything, anything at all. What do you notice about it? Hope and concern. Hi, Smithy. Uh, Hi, yeah. Vandana. Hi, Smithy. This is Vandana. So uh, what I notice here is the caregiver kind of uh, giving direction to the patient. Okay. All right. Taking, taking charge of uh, maybe uh, navigating the patient around. Navigation. Okay. Anybody else? I think they he's showing good. the world uh, from his perspective that uh, he can look uh, okay. to the brighter side of his life. I think like that. Sorry, my internet, I think, is a bit unstable. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I think then Avtar is also is a little unstable. Uh, any Anything else? Please put it in the chat box. I have access to the chat box. I can see it. Uh, let's try and also look at some very tangible things rather than assuming what they are feeling or thinking. What do you see about the picture, the physical aspect of the picture? What do you see? Looking in the same direction, caregiver and the patient. Yes, both are of the same age group, correct. Both enjoying the view, the caregiver shows concern. Yeah. What do you notice about the body language? There is contact. Caregiver looks happier bringing the patient outside. Correct, I can see all of you warming up now. All right, so there are many things that people will notice, quality time with each other, caregiver taking responsibility for the caring of the patient. And uh, they seem relatively relaxed, right? There doesn't seem to be too much distress on either of their faces from whatever angle we can see them from. Uh, their clothes tell us that they're potentially, um, they are, uh, they are, they're they're not from an underprivileged class per se. Uh, they have you know they they they're dressed uh, uh, warmly. Um, they have shoes. They have good shoes on their feet. Okay, so um, all right. I'm just gonna. I mean, uh, I'm just gonna move on from this picture. Now, what does the word um, invisible mean to all of you? What does the word invisible when I say invisible, what do you think about? Who is invisible? About who we seem to neglect, okay? Neglect, unnoticed, is there but not seen. Unnoticed, yeah, that's which cannot which we cannot see, okay, not acknowledged. All right, so 
there are many words, there are many definitions in the dictionary, and most of you have hit most of the right uh, notes. One is the unseen, that who, uh, someone who is inaccessible to view, who is there but is not in, uh, in front of us, unnoticeable. There are people who also make sure that they don't get noticed, uh, and someone who is not noticed by us. Somebody who's not perceived, somebody who's there but not perceived. Uh, and concealed from sight. Some people are deliberately concealed from sight. Don't you think? In the shadows, downtrodden, I can see all kinds of responses coming up. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to look at another set of pictures. Common sight? All of you have come across this site somewhere in your lives? Yep. Okay. And um, when you when you come across a site like this, what do you what 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 normally happens? Do we stop and think about do we stop and think about what we're seeing, or we just you know it's just part and parcel of our uh, of our uh, observed world, so we don't really, you know, it's, it's something that we've all grown up seeing, so nobody really pauses to uh, see the faces of these people, do they? Okay. No one really pauses, yeah. Okay, so these are common sites. Here's another site from a different part of the world. And here you see two children. And what do you see about the two children? What do you see about the two children? What would you, what is the story you would assume when you look at these two children? Healthy and happy, boys holding the girl, support and care. Okay. Compassion. All right. Taking responsibility, their world looks fine. Their world looks fine. Yeah. But I, I suspect that their world was not always fine. And there are two people missing in this picture. who might have a whole other story, right? To, in order for these two children to look like this in this picture, there's a whole other story that has happened. Okay. Now there's this picture. What comes to mind when you see her? Contentment, posing for a photo, yeah. Bright and young and lively. What else? The smile could be deceptive, like the Mona Lisa, of course. Alone, smiling, happy, raw, serene. Okay, great. All right. Okay, now what do you guys see? Someone sees fear, someone sees worry, some tension, frail and worried, distressed, doubtful. Hands are clasped. Nervous, conscious. Go on, anything else? Old age, apprehensive, fearful. And yet she's posing for a picture which she has been asked for. Maybe she's been asked, maybe she's not been asked. For the first time, someone is capturing her face. Okay, so there are all these people that I've shown you. We've seen children from a well-to-do country. We've seen, uh, we've seen 
an elderly lady, we've seen a young woman, we've seen people working in the market, carrying, uh, you know, daily wage earners. Um, and uh, we all, when we see all these, all these pictures, we have an idea about what, what the context might be. We have these worldviews, right? Uh, we are, I also noticed that a lot of you want to focus on the positives. Um, that, I mean, not, not in the case of the elderly woman, I think in this case, uh, pretty much everybody has come up with uh, slightly negative words. But in the case of the young lady, everybody, a lot of people actually uh, said something very positive. One or two people did mention that this is not the whole story. Um, when you look at this, these are uh, children from clearly a Western country. Um, there seems to be some amount of uh, contentment and connection in this picture. And then there's something that is a common scene. Now, in all of these, there is a part of the story that is missing that we won't know, that we don't know. Um, we don't know the health status of these people. We don't know how much, how much really they're earning. Uh, we don't know what benefits they get. Uh, we don't know what their home lives are like. We don't know how they sleep at night. We don't know how many children they, they have. Uh, here, we don't know the struggles of the family uh, that the family has been uh, through. This, this, the, young, the girl uh, has Down syndrome. We don't know what it has taken for the family to arrive at this point where this kind of a picture could be taken. Uh, we really don't know anything about this girl. We know that she's probably from a, a suburban or a rural part of the country. If you go by the greenery in the background, uh, she looks relatively happy. We don't know how, uh, where in the family she, where in the family tree she fits. Uh, we don't know if she's getting an education. We don't know uh, about, you know, a menstrual hygiene practices in the village. In fact, this picture was taken from a menstrual hygiene article. Um, and uh, we don't know anything about, uh, you know, her opportunities that she's been given by her family, by her society, by culture. We don't know any of those things. And finally, uh, you know, it, it, it actually makes me think about the fact that so many of you came up with uh, negative words. It could very well be that this picture, this lady was, this picture was taken at a time when uh, she wasn't ready for the picture to be taken. You know, but then uh, what all the words that people have used tell me that that's the sense that we have about the elderly in our country, right? So um, those are the people that we, we get to see, but there are those that we prefer not to see. Can you give me examples of people and communities we prefer not to see? It's no reflection on you as a person, I can assure you. So please feel free to uh, mention names in the chat box that you think are people that we deliberately look away from. What are some of the kinds of people we don't want to see? You know, when I first entered palliative care, I got people begging at traffic points, people asking for arms, transgenders, people who are homeless. Yeah, so I was saying when I first entered palliative care or even actually many years into it, and perhaps even now, uh, I often get asked, don't you find it depressing to work in palliative mm -hmm. care? How can you be around all that sickness and illness? People don't want to know about that. Okay, leprosy. It's not do not want to see. It makes me think, what can I do? No, Shriya, that's not a, my, my question is not a philosophical one. My question is just what does society prefer not to see? People with extreme suffering. There are actually a whole bunch of communities that uh, a lot of people would not want to see. Sex workers, people with mental health problems, manual scavengers, yeah. It's difficult to see them, yeah. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you some examples here. Uh, this is actually something that happens quite commonly, right? In uh, If you go to like, uh, railway stations sometimes, if you see, you know, behind corners in, in bus stops, um, things like that. And then what happens when you actually come across some, a scene like this? What do we do?
what is our instinctive reaction? Most of us turn away, look away. What if there are children with us? Or young people with us? What is our tendency when we have a young maximum drop a coin or just shoot them away? Yeah. Distract the children by showing something else. Close the children's eyes. Correct. Exactly. We don't like to see. We certainly don't like to see drug addicts, do we? Okay. Uh, someone already had mentioned transgenders. Why, why, why is it that we are uncomfortable? Why, why are we uncomfortable when we see transgenders? Why are we uncomfortable when we see someone using drugs? Making young children understand that this is, um, this is bad. They are aggressive. Hmm. Taboo by society. Uh, just uh, at the, to the point of aggressive, I think, um, I think non-transgender people can be far more aggressive, to be honest. We don't some... think them as uh, normal, normal uh, according to ourselves, because if we are normal like that, I, I, th I think so. I would, I would seriously question our own, all our normalcy, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we don't see them as ourselves. That is the crux of what you just said, Avtar. We don't. They're so different from us. They're so different from us. Yes, so all of these people are so different from us. We would never ever be caught dead shooting heroin up our up our veins in the back of a railway station uh we would never be you know the people who are so like we feel like we're the wrong gender trapped in our own bodies and um we assume that they're different okay fine socially society ostracizes them and we follow the so-called rules set by society correct one more picture other group we don't want to see prisoners They've done something bad, so they must be put away out of sight forever and punished, and we don't ever want to see them again. What do you think happens to family members of prisoners? What do you think happens to family members of prisoners? If someone in your neighborhood gets put in prison for something, for a crime, what is likely to happen to that family? Isolated and stigmatized. People will avoid family members too, yes. Because it can be contagious, right? So, um, yeah, we don't want to be affiliated with any of them because we might, I don't know, something, we might catch the bug and something might happen. So then what happens to all these people? If in under normal circumstances, we don't want to see them, we prefer to avoid them, then what happens to them when they fall sick? What happens to all of these people that we just talked about when there's a healthcare problem? What happens if one of them gets cancer? Do you think a person in who is in prison for murdering his wife, uh, should he get the same kind of care or pain management for cancer treatment like one of us who has never committed a crime? It's certainly not one of that magnitude. Do you think your taxpayer money should go towards that? They should get the care, that's fine, but Will you will you pay for that? Will you pay for it if if it if if there's a if if it comes to that? Frankie, do not have such feelings. What John does that mean? You've not thought about this? 
Humanitarian service above everything else. Yeah. What I'm trying to highlight here is that we all have a limit to what, and it's fine. Not all of us can be accepting and tolerant and, you know, uh, of everything that ever happens. I mean, how many of you think that, uh, I mean, uh, someone who's been accused of rape should get the same treatment, pain management, if he gets cancer? Or a pedophile? We say, uh, we say humanity to infinity, but what are the limits of our own humanity? What is unforgivable to you? Who do you not want to be associated with? I want you to think of one or two groups of people who you really don't want to work with. You don't have to share it in the chat box. This is just purely for introspection. And it's okay for us to have people like that, that we would rather somebody else takes care of. We don't want them to be, uh, we don't want them to suffer, but you know, I'm really not comfortable being that person. So I would prefer it. There are other NGOs and stuff who will go and take care of them, right? Yeah, so I'm just asking you, the, the, there, are, there, are, there are situations that are unforgivable to us. Let's not forget that there is, there is a finiteness to our own humanity. And so when we talk about invisible patients, let's also talk about those that people that we don't like, kinds of people that we don't like and who we think deserves compassion and who does not, right? So uh, this is, I'd like you all to think about this a little bit more. And I'm, I'm very happy to say people who say that uh, I don't have any you know, inhibitions or qualms about anybody, you, you're, you're really quite saintly if, if that's the case. Uh, but, uh, but, but the point is that there are people that there are communities we are not comfortable with and I think what's happening now, especially now in, uh, at the time that we currently exist in, that uh, we are seeing these fractured lines and they are becoming more and more pronounced uh, because of various reasons. Um, yes, it is a personal situation, Shreya, because uh, as a caregiver, there is a personal element to it. There is a personal element. When we are caregivers, when we work in healthcare, when we are care providers, when we're, when we're working in the service uh, delivery system, we are bringing our personal selves to it, right? So yes, there are certain things that are unforgivable to us. What I'm asking you is, do you think that those people do not deserve access to healthcare? Because this is ultimately a class about palliative care. It is a session about palliative care and invisible patients and healthcare. So, Anyway, that's just to trigger some thought process for you. Okay. Now, at the macro level, which is global, inequities exist, right? Did you guys recently uh, did you guys recently read about uh, the you know this article that came out in the Guardian about the vaccine that uh, nine out of ten people in low and middle income countries will probably not get the COVID vaccine because all the existing vaccines that are being manufactured are already being bought up by richer countries. So that's, that's something that is being talked about right now. Yes. Yeah. So now uh, also, how many of you remember Alfie Evans, this little boy who had an incurable condition? This was in the news a couple of years ago. And the whole world got involved because uh, the hospital that he was at, which was a very, very well-reputed children's hospital where the whole team was very compassionate. They just felt that, that, that the interventions that were being carried out on Alfie were uh, futile. They were not going to help him. And the parents who were young, they said, no, we will keep, them, keep him alive. They went as far as the Pope. And here, this is, this is a picture of crowdfunding where uh, people wanted the Queen of England to actually get involved in this case. And uh, at this point, 73,414 people had signed. And, uh, you know, there was this petition and then there were people who were willing to get Alfie across to the US and, you know, keep him on life support, all of those things. And it was a big deal. It was a big deal. It went on for months. Do you guys remember this case? Uh, if you just Google Alfie Evans, you will realize what a big saga it was. But here on this other side is, the, is a picture of a child from India who is malnourished, uh, malnourished and thousands of children die of malnourishment, malnutrition every year in India. And uh, we don't really see any crowdfunding there, do we? 
there are there are people who are dedicated in maternal and child health there are organizations there are people there are there are schemes in the government of course there is a huge effort towards alleviating this kind of suffering but uh, we don't we, we don't you know we see this child and it's so common place for us to see this child uh, we see a child in in africa with a bloated stomach but a shrunken body and in all sorts of other conditions and that is that is something we we are we are sort of now climatized to yes it is a big issue in um, in india mausumi but i'm saying in talk when you talk about global uproar when you hear about globe when you see global uproar on the social on social media how often is there a disparity in the way even the news is projected the language that news channels use the language of print media right uh there is a huge disparity worldwide and that is happening at a macro level now this is just an example of of two children but there are all sorts of other disparities happening let's talk about opioids 92% of opioids in the world is consumed by the global north by uh, by a ridiculously small percentage of people and the global south countries like india and other low and middle income middle income countries we don't have access to opioids even though we are the manufacturer so um so disparities exist on all levels and that is another aspect of you know who becomes an invisible patient because we see so much of it happening i mean here's just another number right okay that's at the macro level there's something called the meso level which is at the community level right at the meso level there are other kinds of disparities that we see now this is something that healthcare expenditure and you see the difference between healthcare expenses uh, for men and women blue is men red is women so if you look at this first square over here average healthcare expenditure um it's from this article that you guys can read it from 2019 and uh, depending on the kind of condition there is if you look at cancer there's a huge disparity on what is spent on men versus what is spent on women and then if you look at this hospital stay the duration of hospital stay for men is also much longer than women what is this telling us is it that women are so much healthier are we really in fact the stronger sex is that what this graph is telling us or is it, or something else what's this graph telling us uh, tells us that how women are ignored lack of access to healthcare yeah yeah we we'll talk about that healthcare yeah yeah we will talk about that in some more time uh, avtar thank you for sharing that uh, but i would say it's not just about uh, you know african there is also uh, there is a power dynamic that comes into play sometimes and uh, we we'll, we'll talk about also what is inappropriate and appropriate social media coverage of these issues right uh, we'll come to that in a bit okay so at the meso level here's just a very quick snapshot of gender disparity but here's something else tribal communities 42% of tribal children are underweight one and a half times higher than non tribal children and this is in a country that is already struggling with nutrition issues and uh, this is just the nutrition angle but there's a whole lot of other angles on malaria tuberculosis infection all those infectious diseases non communicable diseases and what is the burden of care on tri the burden of disease on tribals versus non tribal communities and stuff like that so this is these all ground realities uh, when we share this uh, presentation with you i would like you to please take this as a cue and actually go on to do more research on what is actually happening in our country uh, somebody mentioned transgenders how do transgenders access healthcare and if you read this it's actually really it's it's very heartbreaking uh, 19% reported that they were refused care because of their gender identity 28% reported that they were subject to harassment in medical settings 
they were made fun of or they were treated badly or they were treated shabbily, they were treated as being less than human. 50% reported having to teach a medical professional about transgender healthcare. 50%. Imagine if you had to go to a doctor and you had to teach the doctor about your healthcare issues. You had to tell the doctor about, I mean, I'm talking about the women. You had to talk to them, to, uh, to the doctor about <laughs> menstrual cycles or, you know, fertility or <laughs> things like that. <laughs> so <laughs> disparities do exist. And uh, what this slide also tells me the issues. We don't care to know. Yes. Uh, your voice were breaking in between, so I offed your video. Okay. Uh, it is clear now. All right. So you can see the screen, but yes? Yes, yes, we can see, see it. All right. So what I'm trying to say here is that why is it that we've had to educate people about this? Why, why, why is it that 50% uh, of this community had to educate their care providers? It's because we don't want to learn about it. Similarly, we have found that people are not trained in pain management in hospitals, right? So we have to go and educate people about what pain management and pain control is and why it is essential. So, uh, so this is, so these are just some, these are just some sort of um, examples for all of you to think about. There are several, several, several other people. I can talk about prisoners. I can talk about people who have substance use disorders. I can use, I can talk about, uh, you know, sex workers. Uh, there are many, many communities. And so we, we're actually going to be talking about marginalized communities in the next thematic group. So I'm not going to get into it in great detail here, but this is just to tell you what sort of disparity and who becomes invisible in our MISO level, community level systems. And finally, in the level of families, can you tell me who might be invisible patients in the families, uh, in the families that we see? You can put it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Children, women, females, old ones. Okay. I don't think I need to teach, teach this class anymore. <laughs> Everyone seems to know what's going on. Um, who else? Who else? Men too. Yes, men too. Caregivers. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's start with caregivers. Caregivers are often the invisible patient in the family. There is a culture in our country of, you know, uh, of service and of looking after people, especially our elders and things like that. And it's, it's considered a, a duty. And when something becomes a duty, then it is unquestioned. In fact, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like a caregiver feels that they cannot complain about the fact that they're tired or the, the fact that they're exhausted or the fact that, you know, sometimes uh, it makes them angry to be the caregiver. Uh, if, we, if we say that uh, we are angry, what is society likely to say to us? If I complain about being a caregiver. It's your responsibility. No one will bother. Being selfish, yeah, make us feel guilty, of course. If you don't, if you, if you do not do, then who will? You are not being loyal to the family. How could you be so heartless? Yeah. So the cruelty meted on caregivers is very, very, very high. And uh, so very often uh, you can't even you can't say that, you know, I'm really tired. I need, a I need to take a break from caregiving. Really, how can you be so selfish? It doesn't matter that you haven't slept in six months or you, your uh, social interactions have come down or the fact that you haven't done any self-care for yourself. The minute you look for respite, uh, most people in society will look down on you. Okay. Now, the second group of people I'm going to talk about are non-decision makers. Who are the non-decision makers in the family? Non-decision makers, family members who are not earning. Absolutely. People who control the finances, control the dynamics to a large extent. Not always, but to a large extent. 
children, elders, young children, yes, women, of course, children and women who are homemakers. Yeah. So you guys are pretty much hitting all the right chords, elderly women, especially daughters-in-law. Do you agree with the statement? Usually in our setting, the daughter-in-law is the most disempowered person in the family, even more than the children in the family who might be younger than her. And this is not to this is not to berate or you know uh, point fingers. It's just that this is how it is uh, in a lot of in a lot of situations. It may not be in your particular situation, but in a lot of homes, in a lot of households, the daughters-in-law are one of the most disempowered. Parul says no. Parul disagrees. Can I ask uh, Parul to elaborate? I might be, it might be coming across as a bit of a stereotype, but the, but the, but the, uh, I'm talking about the vast majority. And sometimes the daughter-in-law, of course, is the earning member of the family uh, and all of that. But again, um, decision-making uh, patterns and dynamics might be different. Okay. Now, um, also, what happens is sometimes, you know, if you think about in situations where there has, there has been an arranged marriage and a young lady has come into the house for the first time, and uh, I'm speaking from our own experience where we've seen this in our own practice, uh, she comes into the family, somebody falls sick, and then, uh, you know, the blame is put on her saying, oh, ever since she entered this family, things have started to go wrong. It does happen. Uh, Parul, I'm very, I'm very glad to hear that about your daughter-in-law. I'm not talking about any specific. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that this is the case everywhere. I'm also a daughter-in-law, and my 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 mother-in-law is fantastic. But I'm saying generally in life, in our setting, they are not. They don't have the privileges that your daughter-in-law or I might have. Okay. Children, of course, a lot of you have mentioned. And uh, the children, uh, I want you to please explain, why is it that children um, become invisible? Where does the invisibility factor come from? Age and maturity. Oh, you're his fourth son, Shreya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, again, son. Dependence on parents. Um, because they're not earning, unable to understand the situation. Okay. Because very often we just don't think that children are capable of understanding what is happening we assume and also then we go on to protect children. We, we go, to, go on to protect children from illness. We don't want them, uh, isn't that, doesn't that happen? Uh, it usually is a well-intentioned thing that we do, that we protect children, we don't want them, Are you know, uh, children should be kept away from disease and illness and death and dying and all of those things. We assume that they, by, by protecting them from it, somehow we're doing them a favor. But earlier, back in the old, old, older days, um, children were part of, part of the rituals. And uh, I think there's an increasing trend towards uh, protecting them from mortality and you know, stuff like that. But uh, I think that uh, most children figure their way out anyway. And the thing is that they are very, uh, children can be very, um, children are very imaginative. So if you withhold information from them, they fill the gaps in their understanding with their imagination. And sometimes the imagination is very different from the reality. 
uh, children appreciate honest communication, but it's sometimes it's our fears that hold us back. Very often we think, what am I, I don't know what to say to this child. So it's your discomfort that comes into play and, you know, makes you feel like, okay, it's the children who need to be protected. But actually it's us that are uncomfortable going into that space. We haven't developed the skill set to have those conversations with them. But we will be talking about children and grief and illness uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming weeks. So I'm just going to leave it there. Siblings. Siblings of children, especially who are sick. What happens when a child in the family falls seriously sick? What happens to that child's sibling? Neglected. They quieten. Siblings are ignored. They're distressed with the situation. They wish to be with their younger, elder one, it does not happen. They equally get affected too. Sometimes they're expected to grow up fast, right? And actually, when you come back to the point about children, suppose it's the parent who is sick, suppose the father in the family dies, what do we normally tell the son? If there's a young boy in the family and the father dies, what do you find that a lot of people tell the son? That you are the one who's going to take care. Correct. You are now the man of the family. He is next in line to shoulder the family. So we expect children to grow up very fast and their childhood becomes invisible. Yeah. And siblings of children who are sick are expected to also grow up very fast or they're expected to take care of themselves in many ways. And a lot of the time, what we do to that child is we tell them, you're the lucky one. You should be grateful that it was not you who got sick. And if that child wants anything, suppose he's a six-year-old child who wants a toy, you know, so usually the sick child gets the attention and stuff. And if the, and if the, and if the healthy child asks for something, uh, I've heard this happen quite a lot where this healthy child is, healthy child is told, uh, stop being so selfish, you know, give that to your brother. At least you're healthy. You should, be gla you should be glad you're healthy. What happens to that child as that child grows up? They develop behavioral issues. The, the behavioral issues uh, could, uh, could be um, in order to get the attention of the parents or the behavioral issue just stems from a sense of deep distress a lack of connection. There's something called uh, proximal separation. Uh, we've all heard about separation anxiety, right? The, the anxiety that a child feels at being away or being separated from the parent. But there's something called proximal separation, which means that you are physically in the presence of your parents, but your parents are emotionally disconnected from you. And that has severe, severe uh, consequences as well. And there's a huge correlation between proximal separation and later on substance abuse and substance dependence. So that is something for us to think about. Uh, let's think about another category of person, the spouse of a wheelchair bound person. Can this happen only to children or even adults? Shreya, I think it, uh, the trauma is felt uh, uh, in the formative years, I think the trauma, the, the patterns that are developed uh, tend to go deeper. Uh, that's a whole other thing. We'll talk about that later because uh, I don't think I can answer that in just one sentence. There's, it's too much psychology in that to bring up in one, in one, uh, in one sentence. Okay, so um, let's talk about the spouse of a wheelchair bound person. Why, why is that person invisible? Spouse, partner, primary caregiver. It doesn't have to be the spouse. It can be anyone who looks, who is the primary caregiver. Uh, 
uh, this person is a 24 seven caregiver, right? And the, the difference here, I mean, and, and there is the point that the person that they are caring for is sometimes fully dependent on them for all their physical and uh, physical needs and you know, mobility needs, um, hygiene, uh, all of those things, every single activity of day, daily living. And it's a huge, it's a, it's a huge responsibility. Um, but then again, they are also told the privilege of no disability as Linda has pointed out. It's considered normal by all that they are to take over. Yeah, now uh, we have seen this in our, uh, in our uh, practice as well, that especially when the, it's a spinal cord trauma, a person with spinal cord trauma who's young, who's had a bike accident or who has fallen out of you know, a tree or uh, something like that, and they've recently been married, Again, it, in this case, it could be a, it could be a, it could be a, a arranged marriage. This is the first time the the, the, the girl has uh, met the boy. The first time she's met the family, and she comes in, and like a month later, the boy has an accident. He's he's bed bound, and then what? They're in their early twenties, and now what happens to this woman? What happens to this woman? Uh, and what happens to her if she decides to leave? Let's think about that. If she decides to leave in that instant, saying that, you know what, I'm 21 years old, I have aspirations to have a child, I would like a fulfilling, intimate, physically intimate life, uh, all of those things, what happens then? How is society likely to view her? Yes, she is judged by society. She's stigmatized. It's a decision totally parallel, but my question is what, how will society judge her decision? It will be seen as an immoral decision, as a selfish decision, right? Let's, let's switch the genders. What happens if it was the woman who uh, becomes uh, wheelchair bound and the husband is young? What happens if, the, if it's a young couple, but the husband is the one who did not have the accident, it's the woman? Man will disown her and leave. And will he face half the consequences that she did? It's sad. That's a sad fact. It is a fact. And then, you know, uh, in fact, uh, the family will encourage him. A lot of the times the family encourages him to, to move on because his lineage is so important, right? He has to, he has to bear children and she's not going to have any of his children. So he better move on. So um, yeah, or she might even have to say that she convinced her husband to carry on. She might be coerced enough to say that. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. And finally, substance dependent people. Now, let me ask you a question. When you, when you do a family assessment, and you draw out the genogram, and uh, then it emerges in the course of your discussions with the family that somebody in the family is an alcoholic. What, what is the typical thought process that follows when we know that somebody in the family is an alcoholic or a heavy smoker? Do we trust that person? Yeah, sympathetic attitude alters for, for him or her. Very often that person becomes the scapegoat for the family. We don't trust, yeah. No, she is correct, absolutely. Women have issues with addiction. Now, even there, there is a disparity there, please remember. Men very often are kuleam alcoholics. If a woman is an, has an alcohol abuse issue, even worse. And we don't take their opinion seriously. When we come to a shared decision-making forum, where we sit down and we say, okay, you know, let's have, a, let's have a family meeting to talk about the plans of care for the patient. And then the alcoholic son comes. How many 
how many of us will take that son's opinion seriously? Now, are we also seeing why is that person uh, dependent on uh, alcohol? Where did that where did that where did that dependence start from? And if something happens to him, suppose he has an accident or suppose he falls sick, what is what is the you know the first response? Are he's so irresponsible. He he did this to himself. So looking after him is a headache. No. Who asked him to smoke 40 cigarettes a day? Of course he's got of course he's got a chest congestion. Now it's his fault only. Yeah. Now, so I've just taken you very quickly through these different things. Of course, this is a much more nuanced and a much more uh, vast subject, but I'm just going to quickly now stop uh, with, with, these two, with, with this last slide. What can you do at the macro level, at the global level? We've seen that there are huge disparities uh, that exist at the macro level. Now, we can't go and change the whole, uh, the whole world, but we can certainly try to at least make a small difference. And there are little things that we can do. One is educate yourself beyond what is visible. Okay, I see cancer patients, so that's all I need to know. I don't need to know anything about anything else. I don't need to know about gender equity issues. I don't need to know about uh, child, child rights issues. I don't need to know about um, you know, uh, the rights of the elderly, things like that. My job is you know, to look after cancer patients. That's all I'm going to do. No, we have to educate ourselves beyond what is visible to us. And that's one of the beautiful things about palliative care is that it looks at every single aspect. And uh, we, we do educate ourselves on, okay, what are the things available to this person? What else can be done for this family? What are some of the vocational rehabilitation options that can be brought in? Uh, what are some of the groups that we can link them to? The, the second thing that I'm going to ask you to do is advocate, advocate for equity. Each and every one of you in this room today uh, by virtue of being involved in this circle uh, has now become an advocate for palliative care. So advocate for e equity because palliative care ultimately at, at its heart is also asking for equitable access uh, and appropriate access to appropriate healthcare. At the MISO level, at the community level, cultivate compassion. If you see something being done that is wrong or people are being treated badly, um, say something about it. Because, uh, you know, like they say, if you've, if you've taken the side of, if you've taken a neutral stance, you've taken the side of the oppressor, really. So I, I think especially in these days, uh, you know, it's very important to stand up for something that is right and cultivate compassion. Do it in a compassionate way, not in a, you know, a confrontational way, but cultivate compassion. Encourage inclusivity. Everybody has the right to dignity. Everybody has a right to pain management. Everybody has a right to palliative care. Everybody has a right to, uh, be, to be a part of the decision-making process. So encourage inclusivity. And when you go into somebody's home, make sure that your practice also includes that. Engage the community because it's really the community that should take ownership. And it's when, once that happens, then whatever model of care that you are prescribing becomes sustainable. At the micro level, when you go into somebody's home, uh, to deliver palliative care, to be part of the palliative care service. Uh, one of the things is keep an eye out for who is invisible. If you see a child sitting in a corner, have a conversation with the child. Um, I'll tell you a story about how this panned out for us once. Um, we went on a home visit and um, the patient was this elderly woman. She, I think she must've been in her late seventies, early eighties. And uh, she was, she was, she had a lot of very deep bed sores. She was in a lot of pain and uh, she was very verbally abusive. So she would be lying in bed all the time and she was in so much pain and she was bad tempered also, maybe because of the pain, maybe because of other reasons. But uh, uh, I don't understand Malayalam, but I'm pretty sure that if I understood Malayalam, my ears would have turned hot. Uh, so she was just, you know, hurling abuses and, uh, uh, and all kinds of gallies at, uh, at her caregiver. And she was also incontinent. So she had no bowel control. She had no control over her of passing urine. And so the, this, this, her daughter-in-law was constantly cleaning her up. Now she had one son 
who just who used to go to work and it's quite likely that he stayed out later than he needed to because he didn't want to come home to this so at the end of the day it was just her and his daughter in law together 24/7 and while the bed sores were being cleaned up and while she was being treated uh, the daughter in law was sitting outside and we noticed that she had fungal uh, you know uh, she had fungal blisters between her fingers between all her fingers and they were they were festering and uh, when we spoke to her we found out that uh because she had to constantly clean up the mother in law um she had actually developed ocd obsessive compulsive disorder to wash her hands so she ended up washing her hands something like 100 to 120 times a day now this is kerala it's humid her hands were never dry and as a result she developed these these uh these fungal blisters and uh so what we ended up doing was you know giving her the right medication for it and also giving her a bunch of surgical gloves that she could use uh we also inserted a catheter uh, and things like that so a lot of things became much better but in my opinion she was the invisible patient that nobody was paying attention to and i'm glad that we were able to step in and make a bit of a difference to her life so that's just that's just one story to highlight how some of these things can happen um and finally i'm going to leave you with well i thought uh, this quote and it's one of my favorite quotes it's by arundhati roy from her piece that is called the cost of living and what she says is to love to be loved to never forget your own insignificance to never get used to the unspeakable violence and the vulgar disparity of life around you to seek joy in the saddest places to pursue beauty to its layer to never simplify what is complicated or complicate what is simple and to respect strength never power and above all and above all to watch to try and understand to never look away and never never to forget so this is just something i'm leaving you with and i think it's time for our case presentations after which we'll come back for questions and answers so thank you and over to manisha raju and reshma uh, so ma'am before the discussion round can we move on to patient story and then we'll come back for discussion sure a uh, very good afternoon to all i am reshma ramachandran working uh, in pali media as a medical social worker since 2017 um shall we move to the slides to mrs j um 70 year old female who is diagnosed with the quadriplegia um she does not have any occupation before and after the illness but she is a graduate in home science she become quadriplegic after a fall from height since 1997 she had recurrent infection fever and burso and she became bed bound since 23 years she is also having type 2 diabetic mellitus and hypertension since 2014 and she also have episodes of seizure and on neuro medications um she is having dementia since 2019 and disoriented about the insight as it is a uh, condition of uh, quadriplegia patient and the family members are well aware about the diagnosis and the prognosis but sorry uh, we actually don't know about uh, what the patient um, insight about the palliative care because uh, she is disoriented when uh, the team meets the patient coming to the family overview uh, this is a nuclear family mr j uh who is 72 year old who was a businessman um and they have a daughter 
she is a 45 year old mrs who is an unmarried woman uh, ba literature regarding the other family overview she is a, um, mr j is a 72 year old man who is one of the primary caregivers of caregiver of mrs j he is short tempered and aggressive in nature as reported by the daughter mr j gives all medications for his wife but forgets to give on time as he is getting old mrs a uh, 45 year old unmarried daughter is a, another primary care provider she provide physical care for mrs j father and daughter has a strained relationship he keeps telling mrs that she is a burden for him but she is unable to go for work and concentrate because father is not willing to taking care of mrs j's daily need such as uh, she is having bowel and bladder incontinence um and he does not want to get his daughter married due to the concern of mrs j's care and financial burden mr j is not allowing his daughter to do any kind of uh, other activities other than mrs j's care example watching tv reading and all mrs is hypertensive and it got recently diagnosed as and uh, gets tremor when irritated regarding the social status um daughter as uh, she is having a connection with the church and she is uh, well participating in the religious activities that is the only um, relief what she is doing in her daily life and other relationships such as friends um extended family occupation though those all relations are weak in nature and having connection with the hospital because they are taking a patient for a review and a regular uh, palliative care visit to their home socio economic overview mrs j was mr j was a businessman but he lost everything and the family is now staying in a rented house finding a uh, very difficult to travel for treatment and buying medicines due to the financial concerns no any other source of income and financially drained mrs also discontinued her job as her mother became weak and extended family members are supporting them with pocket money only there is no other emotional relationship with the extended family members they are staying in some other uh, districts and all and about the psycho spiritual overview mr j had great acceptance about the situation he was worried if he could not bear the financial burden in future mr j is concerned that his daughter does not have a job at the same time he is not willing to provide proper care to wife emotional distress expressing as anger anguish and aggressive towards daughter mrs corps up through visiting church and doing worships she does not have much social relationship from her words it seems she has burned out from providing care to her mother though she has plans for future her concerns for her mother pulls her back and makes herself stay at home coming to the total um, pain physically patient having sleeplessness it also comes to the caregivers also um urinary tract infection and retention for patient uh, recurrent fever bed sore um loss of weight and psychologically uh, dementia compassion fatigue for daughter anxiety loneliness anticipatory grief poor social interaction socio economically financial challenges difficult to meet rent unable to pay medication expenses unable to pay travel expenses to the hospital no source of income and spiritually uh, the family have hopelessness and why it comes to us us our interventions about the physical aspects um regular catheter change in a month advice for a uh, ad, advice for the administration of plenty of oral fluids on antibiotic for reducing infection 
bed so management psychosocial aspects such as individual and family counseling swot analysis emotional ventilation vocational rehabilitation for daughter and referred to the nearest community health center for what are the availing uh, medications which they get from the government dissemination of information regarding social security schemes of government and about the discussion apart from patient who you identified as invisible patients in this family how can we try to address the communication barriers caused by the father so that about the scenario Pratima? Yes. So uh, I think there are two discussion points here. Um, the father and bought, daughter, both of them are the invisible patients. Daughter, husband and daughter are both invisible patients. Now, okay, I'm just going to ask people to uh, explain why they think that the daughter and the father, the husband, are both invisible patients. Father's already uh, aged. He knows his limitations. Okay. Why is it that you think the father is being so um, controlling? Okay, can we stop sharing the screen, please? All right, so uh, I'll encourage people to switch on their videos if possible or to uh, unmute themselves. And uh, to just, you know, why do you think that the father is being so controlling? Because he doesn't want the daughter to work. He doesn't want her to go out. At the same time, uh, you know, he's not very, uh, he tends to be a little bit aggressive towards her. That has been observed both by the team as well as reported by the doc daughter. So what do you think is going on there? Thank you, Alpa. I also think that uh, he's quite afraid under all of that. Um, yeah, they, they, of course, is a gender. They, there might be a gender, you know, influence here um, that somebody is able to get away with that kind of behavior by virtue of being that gender. But then, of course. I, I often personally think that when uh, aggression and anger come out, we need to explore what the fears are. Now, if I were to ask you, what are the fears of this father that is causing him to be so aggressive and controlling towards the family? He wants the care through the daughter. What would happen to him if the daughter decided to leave or decided to spend most of her day outside? What will happen if she starts working? What happens if, what will happen if she starts expressing her uh, unhappiness? Then he has to take care of his wife, the roles change. He does not get any rest at all. Yeah, so for somebody who's old, these are big concerns. So uh, I would say that before we judge him in any other way, uh, we need to explore his fears as much and ask him. And let, let, me, let me just uh, remind you that this, that will not be an easy conversation or a one-time conversation, right? Especially a man like that is not likely to tell you exactly what he's scared of. He's, it's likely that he's going to turn around and tell you that he's not scared of anything. Stop talking rubbish. But, uh, but, but sometimes that kind of prickliness comes from the fact that, they, that there is an insecure uh, undertone. 
Yeah. So, um, so how do we overcome the barriers of communication that have been that have been placed by the father? What would all of you do in a case like this? Reshma, what is the what is what is his relationship with the the social uh, uh, with the with the neighbors? What is his relationship? Surely there must be other people in his life that he has some sort of connection or relationship with. I'm not talking about the immediate family. Actually, ma'am, uh, he's uh, con he's contacted his extended family members who are staying uh, in other district and asking for financial help. And uh, they are they all are uh, helping in some kind, just to. Uh, that's that's financial help. But I'm saying, who does only. he talk to? Who does he talk to? Who does he talk to in a normal way? Like we, we have got friends. information that he's not uh, having such kind of friends and all. Uh, he only goes out to take medications and uh, food steps uh, for the family. Um, other than all time, uh, he always be there in the home. Um, as per daughter, she said uh, he had uh, friends earlier, but uh, when that business comes drops, uh, that all lost. Uh, now uh, he mostly his main uh, daily activity is there in uh, home, uh, and uh, he used to, to take care of the wife uh, things and all. And he likes bike ride, and he travel uh, himself alone, and no other uh, near contact with the neighbors and all. So what can we do there to uh, to strengthen this uh, social uh, system? Maybe he's a maybe he's an introvert. That's fine. But can we engage him in more meaningful activities that will make his life seem a little less uh, burdensome to him? And therefore, his his you know if his sense of well being goes up, then he will probably allow for uh, some changes to happen. Do you do you feel do you feel that we could uh, explore that? This is my question to the rest of the group. That's the question I'm asking you, Shreya. How? <laughs> who else can we? Uh, who else can we engage? Financial support and counselling, yes. But also, being an older person, uh, he is less likely to be less likely to be receptive of to, towards just counselling. Another elder from the community, yes. Some, some, someone who has a sense of authority who he can respect, right? Somebody who he will take seriously. Yeah. We need to also strengthen the girl support system because uh, how old is she, uh, Reshma? She's 45 now. The daughter, no? Yeah. So she's 45. Yeah, but she, she also needs she also needs a lot of support. What happens to her after her parents pass away? What happens to her then? If her whole world is just her parents now and it's it's so difficult and she's also expressed unhappiness, what happens to her after they pass away? Youngsters from the neighborhood can run errands and slowly communicate to them. That's an excellent, that's an excellent thought, Parul. Which is why she goes to church. Maybe that's where she gets her community from. Maybe that, that's a community to, uh, to explore and to strengthen. Manisha, I'm a little bit mindful of the time. We have 10 minutes left and we have one more quick case presentation. So thank you all for your inputs. Uh, just, uh, just to remember that these cases are just trigger cases for us to, remember, to try and think about different aspects of how people can become invisible and how we can support them. Um, can we move on to Gayatri for the next case, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, 
yeah as you know uh, this is about invisible patients and communities so uh, my name is gayatri pinayar and i am social medical social worker in palliam india and i have recently joined here uh, in the beginning of 2020 so um uh, what i am going to share with you is my experience uh, with uh, pediatric palliative care setting so uh, we have usually uh, usually we have a op in uh, mother and child hospital here in trivandrum district which is sat sri avitam tirunal hospital so it is exclusively for mother and child and um, every thursdays we have a outpatient uh, i mean a op there so i am going to share a story of one of our children there so about the psychosocial assessment um, our child is child x and uh, he is 14 years old studying in 9th standard and he is diagnosed with chronic kidney disease fifth stage so uh, his prognosis is uh, he want to have a renal transplantation and his mother is the donor and uh, about his medical history uh, he is diagnosed with the same at the age of 12 and uh, he is currently on dialysis uh, having uh, three dialysis per week and um, as uh, as in relation with his uh, disease he has tiredness due to this continuous dialysis and loss of appetite and loss of weight and he, he also has vomiting then uh, when coming to the insight both uh, the child and the family is aware about the diagnosis as well as the prognosis uh, but they were quite unsure about palliative care setting palliative india and everything like that so uh, uh, my primary intervention was uh, i explained them uh, what palliative care setting is and uh, what are the policies and activities uh, which palliative india is being conducting so this is about the insight and uh, coming to the family overview this is the genogram um mr b and uh, mrs b uh, the child's uh, parents mr b has passed 3 years ago and uh, our child has uh, three sisters uh, he is the last one uh, two of his sisters are college going where one is 22 years old and other is 20 and this uh, 20 years old sister is diagnosed with sle systemic lupus disease so and uh, his elder sister who is 25 years old is married and settled far away from the parents i mean uh, parents and siblings so the child lives with his mother and three elder sisters and uh, mother is the primary caregiver of the child and two of his sisters as i already mentioned uh, both are college going one is a bsc student and another is a ba student and one is diagnosed with sle so the child's brother in law is a it professional but that family is not that much supportive and mother as i already told is the donor for the child for his renal tra uh, renal transplant when uh, constructing an echo map uh, the family uh, now it is consists of two sisters and this boy and his mother so they have a very strong bonding between the religious institution uh, between the family and the religious institution and uh, this mother is having a good uh, i mean a uh, a very weak relationship with the occupation i mean the colleagues and all and um, their the family's uh, bonding with the extended family is also stressful especially with the elder uh, sister and her husband then uh, the child's relation with the friends is also very weak and they have a very good bonding between the uh, i mean with the family uh, with the hospital and the school when coming to the socio economic overview uh, they are actually uh, they belong to a bpl uh, category and uh, the boy is registered under talolam scheme uh, which is a government initiative for children with life threatening diseases so they provide under the eight, uh, age of 18 so they provide some kind of financial assistance for these children that is talolam scheme then uh, there is uh, no support from the extended family i already mentioned and uh, no local support systems are also there then mother is the only breadwinner of the family and uh, she has been working as a housemaid to meet both ends so she is the primary uh, earning member and when coming to the psycho spiritual uh, the child is actually unhappy as uh, he can't play with other children 
uh, then a mother is upset with the ill condition of both her son and daughter and she is also worried about her health, health after the renal transplant then uh, even though they are psychologically distressed the family have uh, the family is very hopeful very they have a very good hope and faith in god and they always says that god will punish us uh, god will not punish us anymore at the end he will save us from all our miseries so they are very um, positive they have a very positive outlook then the boy's elder sister had a great acceptance with the situation when considering the total pain of the family uh, i mean a total pain of the child physical it is tiredness loss of weight and appetite and um, so uh, socio economical it is financial restrictions which is the major crisis then uh, they are unable to meet the expenses of medication uh, the fund they have to find the fund for renal transplantation and also they are unable to uh, provide adequate food for the child when coming to the psychological uh, it is depression anxiety acceptance fear and spiritual uh, they have hope and they also have faith in god so they are they are uh, maintaining a very good a very strong relationship with the uh, religious institution uh, and the interventions uh, counseling for both mother and child so uh, we have uh, created a platform for them to ventilate their emotions and vocational rehabilitation of the mother is um, under process now then uh, educational support for the child then to mobilize the community resources for meeting the expenses for uh, renal transplantation and uh, uh, also uh, uh, we are creating an awareness about the available government schemes for both the child and the caregiver so um, uh, coming to the discussion whom do you think is the invisible patient in this case and why it is important to make them visible and um, what are those challenges in establishing effective and acceptable interventions for the invisible patients and uh, what are the psychosocial mechanisms available for these invisible patients to cope with their daily sufferings Smriti ma'am, waiting to hear from the others. Who is the invisible patient? The mother. and um, what are the challenges in establishing effective and acceptable interventions for the invisible patients uh can also be the unmarried sister you're right mother and siblings basically everyone apart from the patient is the invisible patient in all the families that we see but there's always somebody who's 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 uh shouldering a, a more difficult burden right so i would like you to think about that now what are the challenges what are the challenges now we've been through this whole presentation today we talked about so many different things at the macro level at the meso level at the micro level if you think about those kinds of things what are some of the challenges that the mother has to overcome in order to be um to at least have a slightly better quality of life now even that procedure for transplant it's not just the surgery right there's there's a lot of stuff that happens before and after a renal transplant the recipient also has to be in isolation if i'm not mistaken for a particular period of time in order to protect them uh and because the immunity is low they have they're on immunosuppressants when they are when they have a when they have a transplant there is also that that the family is not able to be together at that point yes so someone rightly said she has to do the surgery and then she has to get back i mean if 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 that's what's going to happen pkd needs financial support and donors can be approached to ngos rotary clubs she's the primary breadwinner 
uh, she has an, another child who is not well. And the, and the cost of uh, recovery is also going to be high for the younger child. So it's, it's a very long-term thing that we're thinking about. That's only on the financial aspects. She has to be also given uh, adequate psychoeducation, right? In a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, cases that we see, uh, if, even when we come to uh, CKD and renal trans, uh, transplants and stuff like that, very often they don't have the whole picture. It's not, especially the low and middle, the, the, the much uh, lower income groups, the whole picture is not explained. So they, they don't know how much to expect in terms of recovery time. They don't know what to expect post surgery and so on. So all of those things, somebody has talked about a lot of fear and concern about her child, also about herself. I'm sure she has concerns about herself as well, right? Is she able, will she be able to come back and get back to work immediately? Yeah. So uh, those are some of the interventions. You've listed quite a few others. What are the psychosocial mechanisms available for these invisible patients to cope with their daily suffering? What else can be done? Um, Manisha, can you stop sharing the screen, please? What are some of the other psychosocial interventions? Community support. Anything else? Transplants isn't easy. My daughter's also suffering CKD. I know the mental trauma. I'm sorry to hear that, Shala, ma'am. Yes, it can't be easy at all. Psychoeducation, yes. So uh, we're running out of time at the moment. We actually shoot, uh, we've overshot the time. Uh, but I'd like you all to please think about this a little bit more. And Manisha, we will make some room for, you know, for questions, uh, if people have questions regarding this particular topic. But we will be coming back to the theme of the invisible patient repeatedly as we go further down. And uh, we're also doing a special session on caregivers. And uh, uh, I'm sure we will touch upon some of the aspects that we talked about today there as well. Um, so I think we, we need to close the session now. Um, is Raju there? Support yes, for college teachers and members from clubs can help. Excellent idea, Parul. Yeah, Raju. So, uh, any uh, closing remarks, Shriya, Manisha, Gayatri, Deshma, uh, anyone from this uh, from this group? I hope that what we did today was was helpful in uh, sharpening our lens on suffering a little bit. <laughs> so, I I know that there are many compassion. I mean, everybody here is compassionate, but uh, you know, to just sharpen our lens and to look behind the veil and find the people who are not visible, uh, not just in terms of within the families, but also around us uh, who may be having difficulty accessing basic health care, forget palliative care. So uh, I hope I hope this triggered some thought in all of your minds. Raju, you were saying something. I'm very sorry. Thank you.